Well, hello everybody. My name is Margaret Pinecoffin and I'm a member of Pump Court Chambers. So first point is welcome to the Pump Court Chambers uh, Court of Protection team. Uh, Pump Court Chambers has an enthusiastic and, dare I say it, well-informed uh, Court of Protection team. And uh, if in the future you need advice or representation, then please do come to us, please make inquiries, and I hope that we can sort out uh, whatever your needs are that we can help out. Now, in more general terms about today's webinar, uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat function and I will try to deal with your questions right at the very end and uh, because it, it, they may come at, at any time during that time and it would be impossible simply to stop but we'll return to issues which are raised. If however any of you think of any questions that you'd like to raise after the webinar, something occurs to you, then my email address is right at the very end and please don't hesitate to use that either and I will get back to you if I, as soon as I possibly can. So moving on to the um, content of the uh, um, of today's webinar. Well, the obvious thing to, um, uh, to deal with right at the very beginning is the huge change that has affected us all in the last 10, 11, 12 weeks. And I'd like to, th well, think that if we all ponder on how we have been affected, we've all had changes to our lives, to our working lives, to those who have lost their jobs through COVID, to our mobility, our ability to get out and about, our ability to contact each other, to see friends and family, and to simply our lives have completely changed in the last 12 weeks. But, most of us can understand why this is happening, why we've had to restrict our lives so completely. And for those with young children, explanations can be given. And I also totally understand that there, there is a vast spectrum of effect on people within society. But the people that we work with, the people we support, the people whose cases we deal with in the Court of Protection are those who will struggle to understand why all this is happening and who will struggle to understand why such significant changes have come about. They are also probably from the, some of the most vulnerable people in our society and also probably some of those who are most vulnerable to COVID-19. So if we, uh, the way I'd like to uh, proceed with it is to look at, first of all, what are the problems? What have we all had to deal with? The regulations, what assessments are there? Contact, an innovative solution, and how we deal with residents. Well, starting first of all with the regulations. They change and have changed and will continue to change throughout the time when we are restricted by COVID-19. That has to be the case because what the government has done effectively is to restrict our movement, restrict our freedom, restrict our family lives. And they can only do that in the light of the emergency, when it's proportionate, reasonable, and for a restricted period of time. So, and that's true also of guidance to care homes and guidance in relation to dolls and assessments and so on. It is, uh, guidance can be found on the GovWeb website. 
uh, and my advice is that uh, when each case is presented check for the up-to-date position and bear in mind fundamental points about the vulnerability of the people with whom we are involved and balancing that against the risk to them and to others which is what most of the reported cases have done and that's a difficult balance but uh, returning to the vulnerability point the point that Mr Justice Hayden has made both in his uh, letters to the directors of uh, adult services and uh, in his judgments is to remind everybody that the fundamental law has not changed the Mental Capacity Act has not changed and the uh, uh, rights and duties that we all have under international law and under the, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, those things have not changed and they are the things against which we have to balance all our decisions. And don't forget that decision making is person centred. So it's got to be the right decision for that person and not for necessarily for a group of people. No, sorry, uh, yep, share come. Are you all eight? I, yep, sorry, slight glitch. No, I, moving on from there and looking at assessments and looking at the uh, best interests of the individual person. First of all, the law expects us to behave and to act and to decide things on the basis that someone has capacity to make those decisions unless it's proven otherwise. So is there a capacity assessment? Is that up to date? And what does it affect? Does it cover residence and contact or simply deciding where that person should live and what care they should have are they able to decide on what con on who they should see because somebody may have a long-standing friendship they are almost certainly able to decide that uh, they can continue to see that person subject to the regulations where, where we are now but the fundamental point is the capacity assess is what the capacity assessment covers. But does it also cover uh, ability to uh, decide on um, medication, for instance? Can the, that can P understand why their medication is needed, what each element of it is for, and what the effect would be if they didn't take that medication and the consequences of it. Now it's important then to look at um, what uh, Mr Justice Hayden has said that uh, he points out that on the week before we went into lockdown none of us would really have understood and worked out what the challenges were going to be and what he was then suggesting uh, was that uh, capacity assessments would be, have to be undertaken remotely. Oh, well, there may be no alternative to that, given that uh, if somebody is at home, they may be shielding because of their uh, innate vulnerability, because of uh, some underlying, other underlying health condition or if they're in a, already in a care home and it is proposed that there should be some change or there is a challenge to their circumstances in that care home then like their ability to make those decisions and what decisions they can make is fundamental to that and that for the time being may be needed may need to be done remotely. Well, that raises e enormous difficulties 
Okay, Mr Justice Hayden seems to think that with careful and sensitive expertise, it should be possible. I'm not so sure, personally. Uh, so, let's assume for the moment that there is an existing report. Is that sufficient? Does that answer all of the questions or has there been changes? Do we know when it is likely that there is going to be able to be a more detailed assessment? What other information do you have? Do you have information from the GP who potentially knows that person well? From those who are caring for P? From uh, the care home staff, if that's appropriate? And, uh, but assessments have to be done carefully and have to be done by somebody who has adequate expertise. And that is going to be difficult in the circumstances. If you are in proceedings and asking for a Section 49 report, that nowadays may take time because of the pressure uh, on the on general health services and pressure of time. So, uh, if you're in proceedings and there is going to be a declaration, albeit an interim one, in relation to capacity, should it be limited looking at the evidence that you have? Well, that's not the be all and end all, of course. There are going to be other assessments needed. Assessments of, uh, of behaviour, of medical need, of physical need. Well, uh, an occupational therapist or other more general assessments may be able to be undertaken by, uh, a, by video. And that is a video tour of uh, P's home. Can that be done? Can they recommend uh, amendments and changes? Can they recommend work that might be needed so as to make P's home more appropriate for them? No doubt that can be done even if you need more detailed work later and can put in place appropriate social distancing measures, appropriate hygiene measures. All of those things they have to be thought through. Uh, so those things are important. Then of course, best interest assessments. Well, people who, professionals who have worked with P for a long time, may have a wealth of knowledge, but how are they gathering all the information that they should have? Are they able to see and speak to P in some way, shape or form? Uh, are they able to speak to other professionals, to members of the family? No. Not all members of the family will have access to appropriate technology in order to be able to join in. I also have some huge concerns about uh, P understanding what's happening, being involved in that process. Because after all, what we are all intended to do under the Mental Capacity Act is to work in such a way as to make sure that P has been involved, that P retains capacity, and that uh, such as uh, P is able to express a point of view, a wish, a desire, P's feelings, all of those things are important. But a phone call, when you can't judge somebody's body language, when you can't judge their reaction and moreover neither can they. Uh, it strikes me that it is a little bit like having a telephone call in another language. Uh, you may have prepared what you're going to, to say and uh, you may have a, a good idea about what you're going to say to that other person in France or Spain or whatever but then there comes an answer that you can't quite work out, which you might have been able to do if you'd been able to see their body language 
what they were pointing to, what they were looking at. And it's a little bit like that, I think. So uh, great care is needed in considering those assessments. Now, contact, that's uh, apart from the questions of medical treatment, which if some of you join again next week, well, that's something we're going to look at in more detail. But uh, one of the most devastating results of the COVID restrictions has been the restriction on being able to see friends and family. Now, all the more important for P in a care home, where the P is there because of learning difficulties, because of mental health difficulties, or uh, because of ill health and old age and dementia, or Alzheimer's or in any other form. It's even more important that they are able to man maintain uh, contact and relationship with um, the people that with whom they are familiar. Uh, I would I wonder whether some of those people have suffered a deterioration in their presentation because of the lack of that contact, the lack of uh, regeneration of memory. However good and kind and thoughtful the care staff are, I just wonder whether that lack of um, regular contact with uh, members of your family stirring some memory in the past that may well have caused difficulties and um, some deterioration for uh, people involved in these difficult situations and seeing somebody through the care home window is simply um, insufficient for somebody who in the first place has not understood and i'm sure you've all aware of the first case decided in the Court of Protection in relation to this, the BP and Surrey case. It was decided on the 25th of March as an urgent application before Mr Justice Hayden. Um, and it is still worth reading, even though we seem to have moved on in terms of COVID, even though we seem, it seems like a world away. It's the first week when uh, we had lockdown and the shock of it all was hitting us. But it is important to read it, not only for Mr Justice Hayden's usual care and compassion with which he deals with these cases, but also because he reviews the international uh, regulations and uh, obligations of the, um, of the UK in dealing with these situations and uh, in uh, and as they apply to all of the people we help and support the facts of this case were that the application was made by bp's daughter acting as lit his litigation friend now, pause there if you read to the end of the judgment you'll see that mr justice hayden comments on that how actually being so in, involved as she was in the outcome, it was difficult for her to act as litigation friend because she couldn't really be objective. And in a sense, uh, she was almost putting forward her own case. But uh, BP himself had multiple, multiple difficulties, two most important, were Alzheimer's and his deafness. Uh, that meant that communication was extraordinarily difficult. And the heartrending thing about it is that actually, because he was deaf, he couldn't use the phone. And uh, yes, of course, he could see people on video, but not hear them unless. Uh, they were using the communication board or some other way. So the 
the word that Mr Justice Hayden uses is the seismic changes in that first week of lockdown was significant for BP as for many others in the in the similar circumstances. Uh, the case is also worth reading because he goes through all of the statutory and uh, convention duties on the government. Uh, worth reading because he looks at, obviously, Article 5, Deparation Liberty, Article 8, uh, Family Life, and also Private Life, but in this particular case, also um, the, uh, but most important, Family Life. The positive obligation on the state and indeed through the obviously through local authorities uh, to ensure that the convention rights of the most vulnerable people in our society are not being breached. We know that that um, fundamental decision, that fundamental point of uh, the law under uh, the Mental Capacity Act, but it is um, repeated here because there are so many competing uh, duties and needs and uh, obligations under local authorities have got to comply with at this stage that it is worth repeating. Uh, what is also important is the way in which Mr Justice Hayden dealt with this particular case. He allowed people time, he allowed to, people to uh, discuss things with each other and uh, this case was dealt with remotely and more and more people, uh, more and more of us, are getting used to dealing with our cases remotely and how we can actually use them. It used the, these, those facilities, used technology to manage to discuss things, to take ideas forward and to behave or to achieve a result in the way that we might have done had we all been there outside court and been able to discuss things together. We can actually, we can do it. It just needs a little bit more ingenuity. But to return to, um, BP for a moment. He, what Mr Justice Hayden also looks at is the, is Article 11 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Not to be forgotten in addition to the CHR rights because what it says quite specifically is states parties shall take in accordance with their obligations under international law including international humanitarian law and international human rights law, all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disabilities in situations of risk, including situations of armed conflict, humanitarian emergencies and the occurrence of natural disasters. So it's putting uh, the vulnerable at the heart of what the government should be doing and I'll leave you to think about whether or not that actually has happened or whether in fact people from uh, care homes, the elderly, the vulnerable, those with other disabilities have been something of a second thought catching up with uh, what's happening and uh, whilst the government may be able to point to earlier guidance given at a certain time on what they thought they knew at the time, I would suggest that actually uh, they put other things first and not the most vulnerable in society. And I hope you would all agree with me that actually society ought to be judged on the value on which it, which it places 
on the protection and care of its most vulnerable citizens. And I'm afraid uh, there's a lot to be desired in the way that things are going at the moment. Uh, however, going back to um, BP, uh, what uh, he or Mr Justice Hayden also looks at is deprivation of liberty in the circumstances and how that has affected this case. Um, and um, importantly, he also looks at Article 15 of the ECHR, which provides for derogation from the convention duties in time of emergency. And probably everybody will agree that COVID-19 has been a public health emergency. Uh, because Article 15 says, in derogation in time of emergency, in time of war or other public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Well, pretty much. Uh, the high contracting party may take measures derogating from its obligation to this convention to the extent, and I underline this, strictly required by the exigencies of the situation provided that such measures are not inconsistent with its other obligations under international law. So it's important then to recall that measures for restriction of family life must be time limited, which is why they are reviewed again and again, and consistent and uh, uh, consistent with the threat which is faced. So it's important to look for solutions which are consistent with that. So that's uh, where we were right at the very beginning of lockdown with those difficulties which were uh, facing everybody and which to a large extent people still do face when their loved ones are in care homes where the threat of Covid is still very apparent. However, can I suggest uh, and recommend a, um, a wonderful solution which has been found in France. And uh, I'm afraid I'm not technologically able enough to have been able to find a way to give you the, um, a, a way of reference for you to be able to find it on the internet, but I'm sure that others of you may be able to do so. Uh, I found it on Twitter and uh, you might search Twitter under Reuters. Uh, in fact, it will probably be under the happiness bubble rather than the magic bubble. Uh, but what's happened in a care home in France is that, as you uh, realise, I'm sure, that France has been under much the same lockdown difficulties as we have. In fact, if not at times, even more restrictive uh, than we've had. Uh, and therefore follow, facing the same difficulties with their elderly and vulnerable population. And uh, again, the, exactly the same problems of families not being able to visit and not being able to bring that element of family life to their elderly and vulnerable relatives. Uh, um, and I say that because of the, um, if you do manage to find it on Twitter, uh, then you will see that actually it, it, it's quite heartwarming what happened. Uh, and it may be able to be possible to introduce something like this here. I hope it is. Because what happened was that in the grounds of the care home, the care home managers put in place a uh, it's a tent effectively, but it's a tent in the shape of a tunnel, but with a bubble in the middle. Um, and there are entrances on either side of the bubble. So the family go in one end and the 
resident goes in at the other end. It's all disinfected in and out and so on and so forth. And uh, what, not only can they have a conversation, see each other, which of course is possible nowadays, because if the care home has a garden, then with social distancing, people can go and have a conversation. But in this particular case, what happened was that there was a very thin but impermeable plastic sheet put down in the um, middle of the um, of the tent, so that the resident from the care home and family could touch. Because of the, as the manager of the care home pointed out, actually, as far as her residents who have Alzheimer's concerned, they may struggle to communicate in words because word finding may be something they find difficult or words to fit the situation. They might make find things to be difficult. Memory of a lot of other things may have gone. But one of the last things they have is touch. And that too helps memory. And uh, you will find that it's described, although the, the, um, uh, the English translation there calls it a, a, a happiness bubble, which is true, it is, and that's fine. But actually, uh, what the care home manager described it as is a magic bubble. Um, and uh, because, of course, it does bring about a magic solution. And the other heartwarming thing, if you watch people going into the tent, is that they are allowed to bring their pets, part of the family. Um, and it conjures up such a lovely vision of how this makes a difference to somebody's life. So worth thinking about. Uh, so if we move on from there, what assessments are there in, term, uh, in terms of um, looking at overall well-being and overall best interests? Think about residents. Is the is P either deteriorating at home because perhaps hastened by lockdown don't know or what would have happened anyway uh, or in a care home but it's not quite the right place they're not meeting their needs and that may be true for somebody who presents with learning difficulties behavioral difficulties and uh, which may in part have been caused by a number of moves by a, a long history of uh, care in care homes. What assessments are there already su supporting a move? Uh, what assessments are there in terms of their needs, their behavioral needs? their physical health needs, their physical care needs, and their needs for contact with friends and family, and how is that going to be managed? How can any move in present circumstances be managed? Are there care homes who are willing and able to open their doors to new residents? Few and far between, I would have thought. So that exacerbates, and can exacerbate, the problems faced by families in these circumstances. But in every case, there has to be a workable alternative. And again, uh, well worth reading the BD case because actually with sensitivity, with uh, discussion, actually, and see it right at the very end of the judgment, what Hayden Jay asked the daughter, the litigation friend, was, well, if you asked your father, 
what he wanted? She immediately answered, well, not to be a burden. So she realized that actually what she was hoping for to have him home simply wasn't going to work in the circumstances. But it was about sensitivity, it was about how it was managed. And that seems to me to be so important in these circumstances where we're looking at how families function, how they uh, manage to meet each other's needs, and how important it is also in these circumstances to avoid long lasting difficulties for the family with agreements or disagreements between them. But there does have to be a workable alternative and that is doubly difficult in these circumstances. Either on the one hand because P is deteriorating at home, can't be looked after anymore at home, how is that going to be managed in terms of a move? or where it might be possible for somebody to come home, to be in their own home for maybe uh, the la their last uh, few days or weeks at home. If that can be done, isn't that humane? But it's actually got to work, hasn't it? So uh, there's a lot to think about, uh, which has been well, there's a lot to think about in these circumstances anyway, when you're um, either making an application to the Court of Protection for under Section 21A to challenge dolls or for a best interest decision on where it uh, or where P should live. Uh, or in relation to um, uh, where P should receive palliative care in the last few weeks or months of life. It's enough, an awful lot to think about there anyway, but additional thinking because of COVID-19. So, um, uh, quickly moving on to our last few topics. Uh, habitual residents. Uh, there was a case at the end of last year, QD, which looked at habitual residents. Now, a number of implications for that uh, and why it's an important case is because for a start, the Court of Protection here does not have jurisdiction unless P has habitual residence here. And that may be important because of a number of expats who want or need to come home in the light of Brexit. So um, th those things are important. Um, no longer do we have those reciprocal arrangements that we would have had, but it is in, it was remarkable um, in the most recent judgment about how much cooperation there was between Britain and Spain in getting information of the type of um, assessments that could be undertaken in Spain and the type of care that could be undertaken. So uh, this case uh, quite important to look at uh, because it what it demonstrates is how much information you can have uh, about what's happening abroad and what's happening in this case in Spain but it could just as easily be the south of France or whatever where well, I do hope they're having another magic bubbles everywhere um, so uh, quite important to know about not because it happens every day but this problem may arise and at least you know where to put your finger and where and think yeah I, I know that's there so that's why I've mentioned that one fluctuating capacity um, been an issue that the High Court judges have been um, grappling with quite a lot over time a lot of judicial disagreement over the last, shall we say, 18 months or two years as to whether such a thing actually exists. <coughs> uh, because uh, what's clear from the Mental Capacity Act is that the Court of Protection only has jurisdiction and decisions are only made for or on behalf of somebody else if they lack capacity. But there are an awful lot of um, 
cases where uh, depression may be a factor or depression as an overlying factor over other mental health difficulties, for instance, where capacity may, um, I hesitate to use the word fluctuate, but I can't think of a better one at the moment, uh, but somebody may dip in and out of having capacity or may have capacity to decide some things but not others at times. Uh, and so the judges have, have tried to grapple with this. Some have said, well, actually, I'm only going to make decisions on what's in front of me, on what's being presented to me right now. And uh, looking at uh, the evidence that they have in front of them about capacity right at that time. <coughs> um, and as I say, the issue at any given time is that P may lack capacity then, but may regain it coming out of that depression, coming out of that uh, significant depression, which leads them in a world where they simply cannot see things properly or give due weight to things or retain enough information to be able to make that decision and where they refuse help to do so or have capacity right now but an event which causes them anxiety may cause them to lose that capacity. Now we can see that in other circumstances, in other areas of the law, with uh, parties to proceedings who may have capacity at certain points, able to manage their own litigation. But as the final hearing date approaches, they lose that capacity because of the overlying factor of anxiety. Now, the decision this year, again, uh, looking um, at Mr. Justice Hayden and his decision about this, um, it's uh, an important case to, again to look at because he reviews his decisions and those of others. So it's um, it really does help in looking at uh, of how this has developed. And uh, in this particular case, a young woman who had significant mental health difficulties was approaching the end of her pregnancy. And whilst uh, at that point, all the experts in the case agreed, that she had capacity to decide on her medical treatment. What they feared was that when she actually went into labor, that the, her anxiety levels would rise. Now, one thinks about it. Um, actually, those last few days are wondering what's going to happen, what's going to, um, how is this going to to work, actually quite anxiety provoking, even for mothers who don't have mental health difficulties, particularly if you have any health problems, particularly now, adding my own gloss to it, in the time of COVID-19, with very little support, very little partner support, the restrictions, the amount of uh, of assistance and support that people can have from friends and family, that you, know, you can see anxiety levels rising exponentially because of this. So uh, the medical expert evidence showed there was a risk that she would, would or could lose capacity during labour and that there was a risk that she would not give of appropriate consent to treatment that she might need during uh, during labor uh, for instance an epidural or indeed consent to a cesarean section should that be needed 
So again, with his uh, usual care, what uh, Mr. Justice Hayden did was to conclude that any declaration relating to an act yet to be done, it seems to me, must contemplate a factual scenario occurring at some future point. So, pausing there for a moment, he actually had that in this particular case. It was not something which was <clears throat> a less, a maybe might happen, um, could happen in the future. Well, we don't know. It might, but we're worried about it situation. This was pointing to a specific event. And he was then says, does not strain the wording of this provision. And he's referring there to section 15, section 16 of the uh, Mental Capacity Act. Uh, to extrapolate that it is apt to apply to circumstances which are foreseeable as well as to those which are current. And again, remember the word foreseeable. It's something that uh, lawyers are well used to using foreseeable event. Um, it goes across a number of areas of law. It has got to be foreseeable and not something which is um, a possibility. It's got to be a probability, it seems to me. There is no need at all to diverge from the plain language of the section in making a declaration that is contingent upon a person losing capacity in the future. The court is doing no more than emphasising that the anticipated relief will be lawful when and only when P becomes incapacitous. It is at that stage that the full protective regime of the MCA is activated and not before. Now, <clears throat> I can foresee in reading those words that there could be a great deal of argument about whether or not the event that was described by those who were concerned about P and about P losing his or her capacity to make decisions was sufficiently proximate for that declaration to be made. And I would suggest that if in those circumstances any such declaration should also potentially be time limited. In this case, Hayden was dealing with the circumstances of this young woman giving birth and did not need to become uh, any further involved in her care thereafter. But the danger in these circumstances is if um, the court in making that declaration stretches it on too far so that it can any declaration made on X date in June 2020 could be used again in June 2021, a different set of circumstances. So it's important to be vigilant about that. Uh, last topic, um, appointment of welfare deputies. Now, uh, this is, again, it seems to me, looking at the way in which the Court of Protection has developed since the present form of Court of Protection uh, was brought into being in 2007. It's been 13 years and we've all grown used to it. Uh, there are uh, some memories um, of going off to um, Archway Tower and looking out from the window and being able to see St Paul's all the way across on a clear day and that was probably the, the most wonderful thing about it. Um, but going back to pre-2007 days, the Court of Protection then dealt largely with uh, property and affairs, looking after <coughs> the property and affairs of uh, those who could not manage their property themselves. And that was, to a great extent, the work of the judges up there in Archway Tower. Things have changed enormously since that time. At the same time, way back, uh, 
before 2007. Issues relating to the welfare, the best interests of the vulnerable were dealt with in the High Court under the inherent jurisdiction. Again, that's not a uh, particularly flexible jurisdiction uh, needed um, to go to the High Court. Uh, all sorts of difficulties with that. But those were the, the two options that you had. And uh, when the Court of Protection, with uh, different layers of judges, from the High Court judges down to district judges, came into effect, uh, and we all learn different ways of um, considering the cases. We all learned a different priority in terms of uh, how of the cases that were going to be looked at by the courts, and how that if you look at the cases which are now being reported, uh, the ones that are are. Uh, easily available to us all are those which deal largely with welfare matters and where the considerations of the judges of the court of protection are not just looking at welfare in terms of where somebody should live or the care that they should have but serious medical treatment any forms of medical treatment which are to which consent is not being given deprivation of liberty serious serious matter and in fact one of the reasons why the mental capacity act was put before parliament in the first place because of the bornwood gap and uh, also more recent times uh, the creeping probably not even creeping is not the right word uh, but the effect in people's lives of the internet, control of the internet, what it brings into your life, and the uh, demands that that brings on those who are caring for the vulnerable, all being looked at by High Court judges and others. And, the, and I don't think that those developments were necessarily foreseen by Parliament when the when the mental capacity act was brought into effect but because of its flexibility because of the uh, the way in which it is framed the flexibility of the checklists of the factors that we should be taking into account it has been able to be molded by the judges in order to be able to look at these things now the reason why i uh, raise this is because when the Mental Capacity Act was being considered by Parliament, the Select Committee was told that it was thought there'd be little need for welfare deputies. The vast majority of them would be property and affairs deputies. And that is true. That is what has happened. And uh, in the early days of the uh, Mental Capacity Act, judges, particularly district judges, uh, were very uh, reluctant to make orders appointing welfare deputies, even if the case which had come before them was about welfare uh, and uh, took a diff totally different view. Now, this case, uh, the Mottram case, now brings it about full circle that the appointment of welfare deputies should not be unusual and I'd suggest that actually reflects all of those changes. Now that's a quick counter through some of the things that have changed in the last year or so in relation to uh, the Mental Capacity Act and the Court of Protection. There's an awful lot more that could be said, an awful lot more time that could be taken but there will be an, another similar webinar this time next week and I hope that you will join us. Now I'm going to have a quick look and see if, the, if there are any questions that need to be dealt with now. Um, yeah, uh, second 
point there about um, call, uh, care home in Cornwall uh, introducing a uh, drive-by socially distanced visiting. Yes, um, I also have heard that um, if it is appropriate and can be done, then actually arranging time for the resident or a resident at any one time to be taken out can also be done so but it, but if you think about a drive-by that's great if they they think about um that that would work but actually waving from a distance uh, only goes so far doesn't it but anyway uh, so thank you for that and uh, thank you for listening and i hope that some of you uh return next um next week to listen again when i'll look at some of the other <coughs> issues raised by covid by looking at dolls and the most recent guidance from the government which raises an an awful lot of, or as many questions as uh, it seems to answer um, and I'll keep my comments to myself as much as possible <laughs> okay so thank you very much for listening and um, I hope to that uh, many of you will join in next week <laughs> okay thank you all right thanks all right bye bye everybody <laughs>